Right. Welcome back to uh, the second edition of this parallel session, the European Innovation Council. Again, uh, facilitated by, uh, by Marco and Francesco again. Different panelists, though. Uh, they will be introduced by, uh, by the moderators. Um, this is the final session uh, for today. Uh, we still have a session upstairs around, uh, around the topic of gender organized by the Smart Cities Marketplace. Um, at the, towards the end of the session, we will come back in plenary and then we will sort of close off with some closing uh, remarks as well. We have uh, one of the panelists online. Uh, hopefully, uh, you can hear us as well, hear and see us, hopefully. Just thumbs up. I can hear you. Thanks. So that's, that's working. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to, uh, to the two moderators to kick, off, kick us off, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Uh, we give now the second part uh, of, of the session. Now we will have the, the Patricia Fan with Matteo Androletti. Then we have got Natalia with Nouvel. Then we have got Stefan with B4 Plastics. And uh, last but not least, uh, Rudy from the city of Amsterdam. Matteo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francesco. Right, thank you, everybody. And thanks for bearing with us for the last session of the afternoon. Um, all right, so I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I'm here to represent the, the, the investor community. Uh, so I represent what we call a, a real asset uh, manager. So basically a company that uh, manages uh, funds from pension funds and insurance company and invest that into, into the real economy. Um, let me show you what, what, what does it mean. So the company, Patrizia, is, is, is a German company. Uh, founded 30 years ago, primarily into the real estate uh, sector. So they own a large chunk of probably of European real estate across different segments. Uh, but I'm here to represent their uh, infrastructure division. So this is uh, the co division that invests into infrastructural assets. Uh, we're primarily focused on, on two themes. One is uh, sustainability and uh, circular economy. But at the same time, more and more we've seen the emergence of digital infrastructure as an asset class. And of course, the two complement each other because the journey to, to net zero, of course, the transition to a sustainable community can be done without an holistic approach uh, across the traditional and digital infrastructure. Um, the, the main purpose of this conversation is around to, to probably identify trends and probably elaborate as well on some of the topics that have been uh, already uh, evocated in, in an earlier panel and, and more in particular how the uh, private financing can blend into the public financing to be able to implement, uh, I think, uh, uh, transitions uh, uh, infrastructure at scale. I think one of the numbers that was used this morning by Commissioner Simpson to advocate uh, the impact of, uh, of this program uh, it was a staggering 600 million uh, of projects that were uh, being delivered through this program. But, but then she was also making the point this is across 130 different project. So if you, if you do the math, that's about 5 million euro per project, which of course is, is just a drop in the ocean compared to the over 300 billion per year that the European Investment Bank has assessed in order to be able to meet our climate change um, uh, targets. Uh, on this particular slide, uh, you, you can see a little bit where, where we are coming from, or at least what, what has been my, my universe. Uh, this is a mix of, uh, let's say, real uh, in traditional infrastructure going. We already talked about uh, district heatings, so you can see it on, on the right. Uh, um, let me show it to you right here. Uh, this is, of course, it's, it's a district heat in, in Italy. O on the left hand side, you have solution in circular economy, so using waste to, to, to recover the energy content of the waste. Uh, we thought about, uh, uh, I guess, connected street lighting, and we've seen the city of Dortmund have they been able to leverage the street lighting infrastructure to deliver uh, smart city services and improve uh, what could be uh, uh, electric mobility as well. And uh, uh, a lot of uh, recent activity, of course, has been around the digitalization of our towns that uh, in the first instance goes around connectivity and obviously you see on, on the top left hand side, what does it mean uh, building a fiber network nowadays? Uh, but, but again, that's enough for, for, for today. Everything we're doing is with the link of uh, what, how can we build sustainable community of tomorrow. And I think there is a, we can talk about what uh, 
uh, our living pattern will be and what will, what will be an essential service uh, 20 years from now. But I think there will be little doubts that uh, the digital layer will play a fundamental part in order to do that. And that will go along uh, creating not only ubiquitous connectivity, uh, which of course has to be city-wide and community-wide, so not only focus on city centers, on the wealthy part of, uh, of a community. We need to break sort of the digital divide. doesn't only exist in rural and urban areas, but always within urban and suburban area, having a reliable connection that allows you to implement, uh, I guess, digital a solution like, like autonomous drivers or, or, or tomorrow air mobility, urban air mobility, is still a huge, a huge challenge. And in order to do that, of course, there is as well the, the concept not only of, of having connectivity, the deployment of sensors, which will leverage on traditional infrastructure, and then the data processing capacity, which uh, we were not talking about the huge data centers uh, that we call the hyperscale one that we see in, 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 in geographies that have a cheap access to cheap electricity, but I'm really talking about the urban, the edge type computing, uh, which can be integrated in, in a broader, uh, I guess, energy, uh, energy policy, because it's all about balancing energy requirement to deliver services. Um, so I think that's, that's really what is, uh, what is it really makes difficult to me energy transition is that it's, it's not only the implementation or scale up of, uh, of technology and we've seen some uh, I think innovative solution earlier on in, in the panels and we see uh, how single vertical will continue to fine tune I think their ability to deliver their own target in an efficient way but I think the real complex to achieve net zero and to achieve sustainable economy is to get in the equation between physical and digital right. Um, and and because, because these are two worlds that are very different. Uh, they are different in terms of thinking, they are different in terms of decision making, cooperating. And if you stay on, on the left part of this particular uh, sort of like chart that you see here on, on the value chain of what I see uh, uh, smart city centers, I mean, at the heart of it, this is, this is a construction pro, uh, project. It's all about going into a city center, opening up streets. Uh, replacing maybe older systems and networks, uh, sometimes support systems that were not designed to take on equipment that we need now. If you think about uh, uh, 5G or also we're talking about environmental sensors, it's all need really a hands-on activity that will need to go hand in hand with the, with the digital layer that will involve not only the data collection and the sort of like the open platform that the management of this data will require, but also then the service delivery part, which of course it's it's a tricky part in itself. Um, in, in terms of like market, uh, market trends, so uh, I should have said earlier on, within the infrastructure division, we, we uh, manage as well a 750 million funds, which is dedicated to smart city systems. Uh, this is, uh, again, it's, it's, it's a fund dedicated to pension funds. So this is long-term private investment to deliver the next generation of infrastructure. And I, I will start by saying it's, it's a fund that uh, was born in Europe, but is being invested in North America. And that's probably an, another uh, at the moment. And of course, we're looking to, to change the perception. Uh, but, but it's something I would like to, to come back to that, because clearly Europe is probably a place where we have the highest level of sensitivity around uh, climate change and net zero, uh, but also uh, we, we, we we have some barrier today which hopefully we'll be looking to, to, to diminish and be able to, to remove by cooperation and, and dialogues in, in events like this. But in terms of smart city, I, I primarily see at my end in, in sort of investment activity, we do primarily three, three buckets. There is, of course, the digital announcement of, uh, of an existing uh, infrastructure assets. Um, I take an example uh, about uh, urban mobility and everything we're talking about, roads for instance. Um, the, the, a, um, the, the most, uh, I think, efficient use of an existing asset is how to, to improve uh, the, the, the efficiency of technology with uh, autonomous driving and, and more, uh, I guess, uh, digital-led system can help in some increasing the capacity, so without the need of expanding. Of course, the, the best way of increasing capacity is to reduce demand. And I think there is a whole topic about uh, how we can develop a new type of mobility. But in terms of like moving uh, goods uh, and organizing flows within city, of course, technology can play a big, uh, uh, a big uh, um, 
a big item, and there is a lot of investment will need to go towards that front. There is as well uh, another part of uh, uh, investment that can go in terms of like uh, uh, enhancing uh, the, the maintenance and, and the awareness that we have on infrastructure. And that's all about uh, improving the, the sensor capacity we have in our city to be able to, to take better decisions. Uh, because the, getting the data is not also to, to, to put in place preventive maintenance, but also to do simulation that would allow to, to better planify uh, the resources that we use in urban environment. Um, and also in an optic, of course, of, of sustainability. And, and last but not least, we're already seeing the, the drops of sort of like the new generation of urban infrastructure with things like uh, electric mobility. We're talking about new way of uh, meeting our heat demands. And of course, the whole uh, pollutions of city center and quality of air will be a huge challenge that we'll need to tackle collectively. So just to, just to conclude uh, um, and to open up uh, to, to, to questions, um, a lot of what we said today, and in, in the first panel, if you remember, there was a, a debate around what is holding back uh, smart city deployment. Is that uh, access to finance? Is that uh, better communication, better awareness, and better engagement? In, in, in sort of like this slide, just as a concluding remark, I would like sort of like to throw away probably three uh, topics that we see often in, in our uh, activity as, as investor across the globe. So first of all, uh, I mean, clearly n nothing of this can happen without having a strong leadership. And that involves both from the public and, and private sectors. Is what we call being a catalytic leadership. So being able to uh, take decisions that have an impact much beyond the remit that we, we would think. And look, I think a lot of innovation, especially in Europe, will come from, from small communities, small cities. Uh, we're seeing the example of Dortmund, and we'll hear uh, soon uh, what Amsterdam is doing. But uh, if in a country like, like mine, for instance, 70% uh, of the city actually less than uh, 10,000 people. That's, that's the reality about Italy. And there is a lot of talent and, and good idea that are coming for small city. And my advice to, to everybody, think big. Because the only way to solve a local problem is to be able to, to have solutions that are scalable. And by definition, in order to, to scale um, uh, an infrastructure, of course, you, you need two things. You need demand aggregation, which uh, uh, the EIP is, uh, is constantly pursing, and some sort of standardization. Uh, that's, uh, that's the other things that uh, definitely will help at our end to be able to meet the investment task. Um, we are in, uh, in Brussels, the, probably the, the home of, uh, of policy and standardizations. I mean, clearly there is, uh, I think, quite a lot of work that needs to be done in order to, to define what uh, the next generation of infrastructure will be. And, and last but not least, uh, we're talking about blending. I mean, that's the old reason, blending of finance. Uh, that's your reason of uh, um, uh, us being, being here today. Uh, there is uh, uh, quite a lot, and we heard uh, in the previous panel how public finance uh, is, uh, is fundamental in order to get good ideas off the ground. And I think that's, that's paramount, uh, uh, the, the, the objective has to be in order to kick off the idea. Um, we, we've seen that uh, success story uh, requires scales. Uh, as I mentioned before, the internet task is huge. And another, the last sort of concept I would like to, to leave uh, the audience with as well, that uh, we are the, uh, the managing director of Clean Tech Scandinavia uh, suggesting to city leaders to pick up the phone. I think dialogue will be the, uh, the solution to that. And uh, from, a, from a private financing point of view, uh, I would say it's, it's, it's not uh, uh, liquidity, so it's not really uh, euro that we, we are looking to bring, but also good idea of being able to share best practice across different cities and also to create the scale that uh, if we look at uh, on the other side of Atlantic has been uh, probably one of the key uh, success ingredients for them to be able to create uh, uh, giants and, and and, and, and a unicorns. I mean, in some way, um, we, we do need to, to be able to achieve the same level of scales. And, and uh, one of the advantages of working with private financing as well is being able to go on the barrier of sort of like regional, uh, um, regional sort of views. So that, that's sort of like all uh, I, I would like to say. Of course, there is quite a lot that needs to be done, and uh, there will be dedicated session starting from tomorrow morning about uh, business models and, and way out to do it. But uh, just to close the first day, I wanted to, to give that sort of like a first uh, 
round of what is possible and the journey that we can do collectively from transforming traditional infrastructure into a future-proof uh, uh, community. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Matteo. Very clear presentation. I would say that you showed that there is a lot to be done. And uh, I think that uh, the, the question, I don't know if there are questions from the audience, someone from the cities. I mean, yeah, I come. Thank you. Your organization seems to be very interesting. It's a European, uh, uh, let's say, invention, some year, 2006. Uh, co correct. It's European based, but of yes. course it's a global. Uh, why are you focused also in North America? You see, you see it as an expansion to our European approach, or you see it as uh, selling their technologies here? Because where, wherever you mentioned, we are not having the advantage. Uh, in the investments in the smart cities, the technologies are belonging yeah. to North America. No, absolutely. Well, I think that's just a fundamental of, of the world. Whether it's capital market of innovation, we are in, in, in global competition. Um, and, and, and a lot of what we do, of course, is, uh, is, is not only coming, uh, coming from Europe. I mean, whether we want it or not, we live in sort of interconnected economies. Uh, and. Uh, um, I think that there is no sort of like a country that has a, a monopoly of innovation. As a, as a private investor, we do uh, sort of like work all over the world. So there is not any specific reason behind, save that we, we do want to accelerate the net zero transition, irrespective of that where it happens. I would say uh, a carbon emitter in North America has the same impact as a carbon emitter in Europe. cooperation is definitely required for that. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo, for your introduction. We will leave the floor to, to more questions uh, in the next uh, session. Now we leave uh, Natalia to introduce your company and then we go on with the questions. Thank you, Natalia. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, let me start my presentation. Let's talk about challenges that we have today. And all the challenges we are all aware of. Urbanization. By 2050, 70% of people are going to be living in cities. Green Deal, cities have to change, and they're changing now. They're introducing more car-free zones, more pedestrian areas, and more initiatives. At the same time, we're buying more and more things online. That means we're also having the problems with air pollution. And we can change all these issues, or all these challenges. We are Newville, a company from Hamburg. We developed an electric trailer for the last mile delivery. Our e-trailer is synchronizing with a bicycle automatically. That means it can speed up, it slows down, it accelerates and brakes and stops together with the rider. You don't have to do anything. You can, you can transport lots of weight, up to 300 kilograms, without making any effort and without feeling anything. It's the first electric trailer for the bikes for the last mile delivery with a patented sensor technology that we developed. You can connect the electric trailer to any bicycle or electric bike within a second. There is nothing else to install on in the bike. When you disconnect it, you can use it as electric handcart for pedestrian zones and inside the buildings. And the same thing when you move heavy stuff and bulky stuff, you don't feel anything. Now we talked about, there are many different technologies. So we talked about autonomous vehicles, uh, there are cargo bikes, but uh, all these technologies, you know, they are developed everywhere. What makes us different, we are not trying to make a new solution. We're actually adding more possibility and capability and functionality to the most sustainable vehicle, a bicycle. 
Our e-trail can be used anywhere, on the bike lanes, in pedestrian zones, inside the buildings, on the streets. And this is a technology that can be used today, not in five years, not in 10 years, but today in every city and every town in Europe and worldwide. The e-trailer has a design which, is, uh, which can be used by anyone. It's uh, gender friendly, friendly so uh, it's uh, independent of the gender, independent of the age, and also you can use with any type of the bike. Um, we already have experiences with big companies, and it's not really usual for a company of our size. We've been working with UPS since 2016, since the, since the very beginning. And from 2019, they're already having our trailers in their daily operations in five different cities in Germany. And we're here in Belgium. Last year, we won public tender with Belgian Post. And this year, we're delivering fleets to them. So we are supporting B Post in their attempts to electrify and make their last mile delivery more efficient and more sustainable. Um, interestingly, the biggest fleet will be delivered uh, to Brussels in summer. We are also working with retailers like IKEA, and here we have a different concept. We are helping or enabling IKEA customers to move more weight when, every time when they buy something at the IKEA for free. And those not waiting for the delivery van, um, but come to the IKEA store on their own with the bike um, or just walking. We're talking about the city store IKEA concept. We have three verticals. We are working in the B2B, it's a post and parcel. We're working with the retails, but also we work with municipalities and cities. We are working with cities in Germany, in the Netherlands, uh, in Ireland. Um, and we have many different use cases. For instance, uh, our trailers are used for the library services, for maintenance of the parks, uh, for waste management. And I will be very interested to hear your suggestions and ideas and explore opportunities together. Um, we won EIC Accelerator Fund uh, two years ago uh, to develop our technology further. So the, this trailer can carry 120 kilogram and the next trailer will be able to carry 300 kilogram, directly replacing the vans in the cities. We've been recognized as top 50 mobility startups in Europe and we continue to grow. So who we are? Uh, my name is Natalia Tomiyama. I'm one of the co-founders and managing directors at Newville. We started the company in 2016 in Germany, in Hamburg, together with my co-founder. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer with an MBA. My co-founder is an uh, aeronautical engineer, and today he's responsible for product development, and my role is business development. We are today 36 people coming from 14 different countries and 30% of females in the leadership position. So we are quite diverse and dynamic team. I'm, as I said, uh, we, it's all about partnerships and I would like to use this opportunity to uh, speak to you and um, to explore uh, potential collaborations later. Uh, it's all, we, we always work, it doesn't matter what customer is, small or big, we always start with a demo, we run a test together in operations, we adjust the design uh, towards customer needs and uh, we hope to continue into the implementation at Partnerships Together. Thank you very much, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Natalia. I would really thank Natalia because uh, when preparing with Marco, Juliana and Johannes the session, she made many questions, interesting questions to us. Who will be the audience? What will I have, have to say? And we were not very clear. We didn't give a lot of answer, but I definitely have to say that Natalia did a very clear presentation, exactly what I would have loved her to do because in the end, in the end she sold she showed what the cities uh, would need to do if they want to collaborate with, uh, with her. Just obviously she has been with her company, I mean, working hardly to do this. And so thank you, Natalia. Give the floor to Marco for, for the questions. And yes, thank you, Natalia. Very fascinating technology. Your main competitors are electric vehicles, basically, and technologies that are not using uh, bikes to, to move. Uh, and uh, we yeah, thank you for the question. I don't think uh, electric vehicles are our direct competitors, to be honest. I think it's a big umbrella with, uh, under which we are all working together because for some routes, our trailers are, you know, are just too small. And if you talk about the suburban deliveries, it's not for cycling, it's a lot of effort. So our trailer is for uh, really last mile delivery for very densely populated areas. Because even if you have electric van, 
it's so hard to deliver in Brussels, in London, in New York, in Paris. There is just no space for parking. And that's why we're saying the vans, are per electric vans are great solutions, but maybe for the longer distances, while our electric trailer is more convenient for these densely populated urban areas, the areas where you cannot go even with a bike, you can actually, you can only walk. So it's like door-to-door -door delivery. Uh, so that's what I think it's not really, uh, it's, I think it's a complementary product rather than a competing product. Yeah, thank, but you don't think that even for small um, distances uh, and electric vehicles could be an alternative for one mile, so very, very short distances, small size electric uh, vehicle could? Oh, sorry, I misunderstood. Our, elec our vehicle is also electric vehicle. It is, So exactly. Yes, and we connect uh, our electric vehicle to bicycles or electric bikes actually doesn't matter. So we are a complementary product to the electric vehicles who don't have enough space or payload to move uh, heavy stuff. We're speaking about the bikes, electric bikes, but in the future electric scooters and mopeds. Because if you look around, there are many technologies and solutions, also autonomous vehicles who are coming, but all of them, are they really for heavy load transport? Are they really for the bulky transport? And what we're saying, like all this, you know, um, electric scooters that you can use for sharing, all the bikes, but to be honest, there is just no solution that you can use easily for goods transport, either if you're a private person or a company. Um, and the only alternative is the car or electric car, and that's what we're saying. We want to bring a solution that can be used by anyone, can be used as an alternative to the car or electric car, and uh, can be used in cities. And also for uh, nice travels in the wild uh, side. With, if you put a, yeah. a camper behind yes. electric, <laughs> That's a very <laughs> nice that would idea be, as yeah, well. That would be the next solution, yes. But a, a lot of connection with, with uh, smart cities and uh, te uh, key uh, technology to decarbonize um, uh, transport in, uh, in, city, in cities. And um, thanks, um, Natalie, for, uh, uh, for, for your uh, uh, presentation. And uh, also we had um, the same kind of consideration with Stefan that will um, present now uh, B for um, P, uh, his uh, technology. He, he made, uh, as you, Natalie, some question about what is the relevance of my technologies transforming um, um, uh, bio wastes into valuable products, into bioplastics. Uh, what is the, the connection with uh, cities? Um, where well, well, there is uh, an interesting connection, Stefan will uh, present us uh, his uh, um, uh, technology, his project. Uh, uh, there is a question before. Okay, please. Two questions, and then we will leave uh, give the floor to Stefan. Let's listen to the question before. Thank you. Very, very excellent work. Uh, uh, do you, have you, what are you doing when you have uh, mountains? You have cities in the mountains. Uh, uh, Absolutely, yeah, that's, um, that's been our, uh, our challenge. And for this reason, two years ago, we applied for uh, EIC Accelerator because for this current trailer, it's a three-wheel trailer with a motor in front, so it can go up to 7.5%. So it's rather for flat cities like Hamburg <laughs> or uh, Amsterdam or Copenhagen, not for uh, like, you know, I don't know, south of France or Spain. And for this reason, we applied for the funds. We received 2.2 million to develop the technology and to uh, build the new trailer based on the same sensor for, to use in a hilly and mountainous uh, areas. It's not only the countries you mentioned, it's Greece, Bulgaria, Romania. Absolutely. Uh, we have a lot of Italy. countries in uh, Italy, uh, uh, Switzerland. Um, okay, I find also very charming uh, the, the, the technology and uh, it's very agile. And uh, um, So my question was, uh, yeah, the, given the autonomy and the agility, um, and because they are uh, self um, yes. um, few, yeah, they are autonomous in, in uh, powering. Uh, could you make little trains because that would add to the agility in cities? That would be very interesting. Actually, we tested this, yes. So because we have the sensor technology that detects the movement in front, mm -hmm. you can connect the first trailer to the bicycle, the second to the first, and the third to the to the second. Yeah, exactly. It was my yeah, question. it's working. Uh, however, I don't know how this train will work in cities because it's it's long train, but it's possible as well, yes. Our customers haven't tried yet, but uh, I think uh, it is possible. 
Thank you, Natalia. If there are no more questions, Matteo, Rudy, do you want? Do you have questions? Yes. Yeah. One question that comes to my mind is uh, with, with all these new uh, types of uh, vehicles on the street, I know that, for example, in, in Amsterdam, the, uh, the, mo the, 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 the pet, uh, the steps, uh, well, the, the ones you see here in Brussels, they are forbidden um, because of safety reasons. So how about regulations in cities for these new type of vehicles? Yeah, absolutely. It's a very, very important question. And uh, as hardware manufacturers, it's all about safety and functionality for us. So um, there are two levels. We specifically develop our technology for bikes. So we're following all bicycle regulations. Our technology is compliant to uh, European norms and local norms for using with uh, bicycles and electric bikes. That means the motor power of 250 watts and the speed maximum 25 kilometers an hour. And if you use as, if you walk with it, the speed is automatically adjusting to six kilometers an hour. We have three level brake system. Uh, my co-founder is uh, lead in the work group for uh, harmonization of the norms on the European level for cargo bikes and electric trailers. So we are uh, also, you know, it's in our interest uh, to bring the safe technology and I would, I would not say eliminate, you know, but there are many attempts as well and there are technologies which are, were not tested, were not certified and in the end we had big accidents, right? We don't want to have it, and that's why we are also following uh, the norms and regulations, and we are part of the uh, working group uh, who uh, tries to harmonize all the rules for the heavy uh, psych cycle logistics vehicles and also electric trailers. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, maybe one question, given you have a lot of city planner in, in the room, and if it was one thing that you would ask to them in order to uh, accelerate the, the adoption of your solution, which one would be? I would say don't be shy, come to us and let's start working together because it's all about the pilot, it's all about testing. We know that, I mean, I, there are aggressive salespeople, I mean, <laughs> in the, my industry, but trust me, we don't want to sell, we want to have partnerships with you, that's why I'm all for testing, let's test together, we will provide you a solution, we can hear about your problems, and we are basically a solution provider. Let's start testing and see where our journey takes us. Thank you, thank you very much. Now we can see how we can also increase the, the, the sustainability of the materials that we can use for these products, from tires to um, box and whatever. For this is the reason why we also have the pleasure to have here uh, Stephen from B4 um, Plastics that uh, also had the same question about the relevance of his technology for, for smart cities, but there, there, there are a lot of connection and he, I'm sure he he will try to, to give us a flavor of this potential uh, application of uh, circularity, sustainability, biomaterials also to increase the, 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 um, uh, the sustainability of um, uh, our cities. Please, the floor is yours, Stefan. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Marco. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, I want to excuse me. I'm uh, like... Uh, less than 25 kilometers from Brussels, but I missed the last half hour to reach you all. So I would have loved to be uh, together with you, but let's hope I'm close enough. Um, I extremely enjoyed the former presentation. Um, the presentation I have prepared is a little bit more standard, um, and I will have to explain a little bit the examples that indeed, Marco, as you have said, can become very applicable in urban uh, city situations. So it's all about designing novel plastics. We even call it uh, the design of the new plastics economy. And on the next slide, you see that the vision that we have is uh, one that says that there is a lot of room, more and more room to think about redesigned materials and to create that new plastics economy. Uh, on the next slide, uh, the mission is there, and that is how we try to make that happen. Uh, from Belgium um, at the moment, but with a very, very international partnership, I recognize what um, has been told um, about the electric uh, trailers. Um, the mission we try to fulfill that um, 
design of novel materials by having uh, our polymer architecture company set together. Um, we are with a team of about 20 people at the moment and we catalyze the introduction of novel biomaterials and we grow them from niche to dominant bulk applications. And today I have especially noted a few niche applications that might become more and more important in urban situations. Next slide. So the time ticking problem, um, we can approach it from many, many angles. Um, I think all answers are maybe a little bit different if we ask to ourselves, but one of the main problems I want to bring today and where B4 Plastics wants to be leading in the world in terms of innovation potential, it is the term microplastics. Uh, it's also the last sentence on the slide, plastics are getting under our skin, literally. Um, it's being found month after month now, even week after week, that microplastics are found um, near the top of the Mount Everest, in the deepest oceans, and also in our own bodies. Um, a few months ago, it was detected in um, blood. Um, it's being detected in our deep, deepest pockets of our lungs. Uh, we don't know exactly yet the tox, um, tox consequences of it. But the fact is that at B4 Plastics and, and luckily more and more companies around us, we are more and more ready to provide solutions. And I also take the sound of the, of the former um, presentation. It's about trying out in the world what other materials could be used in, for instance, urban situations that can avoid microplastics to a large extent. So next slide. How we do that? And well, I'm a little bit proud on this slide because there's still a lot of white uh, on the slide um, and still it is a distillation of like more than 10 years of thoughts because cracking the nut, finding the key to open the door to the bioeconomy is not so evident. Um, I have uh, worked for about 19 years in industrial chemistry in the, in the industry and um, uh, we have seen a lot of um, trials, a lot of promises, um, a lot of goodwill, but so it's not always so easy. Um, this is a distillation of a few principles that we have been testing out as before plastics. And on the left side of the slide, we try to start from renewable raw materials and as local as possible raw materials. We believe in a very decentralized system. So um, exporting raw materials to other sites of the world, so to say, is not common practice for us. Well, it is common practice, but we want to get rid of it. From those resources, we go to building blocks from there, and that's in the center. That's what we do on a daily basis with some 12 dedicated scientists. We convert it into novel backbones. And from there, we can differentiate. And luckily for us, we have clustered it in technology platforms. And I will document of each of those platforms two examples how urban cities can be um, benefit can have benefits from them. Next slide. So those are those uh, technology platforms. Um, I might take those slides and then we can go a little bit faster to also have some time maybe for interaction. Forte plastics, um, as is stated there, it's the strongest materials today that are still degradable in natural habitats. And that means that also in urban situation, you can think about um, certain textiles, for instance, for applications. Um, to that in the next slide, I, I just go on rubber plastics. Um, I have one little example here. Plastics and then O oh, energy plastics. And indeed, the forty plastics, um, that is where I have a note that my line is unstable, but you can still hear me? Yeah, we had some seconds okay. of uh, delay, but now it's uh, it came back to the right way, I would yeah. say. Perfect. Sorry for that. Um, for the plastics, I brought two examples for urban situation. Um, interior textiles, it's proven that on carpets and even the clothes that we are wearing, there is a lot of microplastics that are released, not only upon washing, but uh, just by wearing it out, by using it. And we are experimenting with uh, carpet manufacturers, but also with textile manufacturers, uh, sometimes uh, big brands that are very keen to make their novel products 
microplastic free or microplastic freer. This is not just hocus pocus, it is the fact that the current microplastics released from textiles, they have an, um, a window of several centuries and we try to diminish that window and make it much more degradable also in human bodies and in um, living fauna and flora uh, around us and also in urban situations. Another small example is for instance tea bags. If you want to meet people, and of course that happens more in urban situations than elsewhere, you can drink a tea or you can drink a coffee, but especially the tea, which is then in the tea bag sometimes, um, it's unbelievable how many microplastics you inhale and you get into your body by just consuming the tea. Um, so we are working on novel textiles that can have tea bags, which are much more mild in the microplastics release. So next slide. Uh, for trigger plastics, we have been experimenting in the market and actually on the Belgian market, we were the first uh, that brought home compostable drinking straws. Of course, some of us might know that Europe is very active in regulations um, about drinking straws, especially. They have become the symbol, more or less, of the plastic pollution. Um, um, but still, we had them in the market before the single-use plastic ban was entering um, July last year. Um, and we think it still makes sense, not only for straws or per se for straws, but for many other products that are used in cities to make it much more spontaneously biodegradable if there is a danger that it's leaking out to the uh, environment. That's important to say. It's not that we want to have everything degradable because recycling systems can do the job to a huge extent, but the losses we get and the, let's say the 3% of leakage, which is a fact today, not only in cities, but also towards our ocean systems and so on. We want to secure that microplastics and the whole food chain contamination by the plastic release is much more um, uh, tempered really at the source by the, the, the smart design of the novel materials. Um, another example of uh, trigger plastics is, for instance, new degradable ingredients, which we have in many cosmetic products and on a daily basis are just uh, disappearing in the environment or through your sink in your bathroom or just spontaneously um, um, in the day. So next slide is, I think, rubber plastics. Yeah, and for rubber plastics, um, I definitely will take contact um, uh, with the, the electric um, uh, transporter because um, I have here a rubber plastics in my hand. I don't know if you can see it. It's just a small dog bone uh, rubbery uh, material. And it's one of the first rubbers that have been developed to be degradable. So you might hear me come, a new European partnership is born because we are experimenting the rubber material for uh, full tires. And I understand this might become important, not only for electric trailers maybe, but for all kinds of urban transportation that we might anticipate in the future. It's um, known that microplastics from tires and so from transportation is one of the main sources of contaminated air that is inhaled by billions of people living in cities today. So that is where the rubber plastics come in. Another um, a very obvious example is that we are trying out these um, degradable rubber materials also for shoes. Why would we not start to think about put on your city shoes in the morning? I mean, our shoes are wearing out. Uh, the shoes after a few years have their uh, under rubber is a little bit thinner than when we buy them new in the shop and the remainings of that shoe are still with us they can be recycled but everything that is worn out the microplastics that have been released they are just in the open air so the billions of people that live in cities and that normally wear shoes they can start to consider to have shoes that are microplastic freer than the normal shoes that we have today 
And then on the next slide, uh, we are also working on low energy plastics and our vegan leather platform is there leading where we can avoid growing um, cows and other uh, leather producing animals and prevent to kill those animals uh, to harvest leather products. So we are underway to um, develop now from Europe um, uh, leather products or leather, leather substitutes, leathery uh, textiles that can be derived from um, local biomass, eventually via, via mycelium uh, technology. So next slide, and then uh, we can speed up a little bit. Um, this all goes hand in hand with a lot of uh, services. And on the next slide, also a lot of um, um, uh, unit operations, materials analytics. Um, um, we are busy with building a big library of bioplastics, um, one of the biggest today, so that we have a lot of um, um, even predictive power in the library to anticipate on novel material challenges that we see in cities and elsewhere. Um, and then the next slides I will guide you through in a few minutes. Um, the reason why we are existing today is that we, um, we start with a screening phase. So there are more and more material challenges out there and the challenge is out, but you still have to start from a technical readiness level two or three in a laboratory environment. And we do that in a very fast and accurate way, or we try to do that, and we are more and more successful in doing that. And that is how um, the, the examples that I have been talking about in urban situations have uh, come forward. Uh, forward. Um, typically, we have innovation cycles of two, three years. So don't expect the, the, the solution for the challenge already next year. Sometimes it takes you two, three years. But we try to scale very offensively in pilot uh, equipment and then we try to make sample material and we try to deliver that in supply agreements with our uh, often brand owners, which have a lot of brand equity because the people in the streets of the cities are generally very motivated, but they need more solution and more um, responsibility feeling that they can help uh, to solve the whole problem. And that's where we see a lot of brand equity, as it's called. Um, most of our customers and partners, I would call them, are brand owners. So next slide. These are, uh, I have, these are two of our products. Uh, I have documented Biorix, that's the first OK home compost degradable uh, drinking straw in the world. And then on the left side, it's one of the first uh, plastic materials that are brought into the market with an afterlife uh, service. It's actually plastics as a service. This particular product comes into your hands with a smartphone app that predicts already the length of the degradation uh, time that you will need to compost it again in your compost bin, even before you have pressed the print button on your computer. So it is an extreme uh, afterlife consideration that you can uh, take uh, um, with you in your considerations, whether yes or no, you want to have this article being born on our planet. A little bit, if you uh, buy an electric um, car, for instance, you will also make, of course, uh, the consideration how many loading cycles can this uh, battery have? Well, it's a bit comparable. It's for the first time that materials are being served with afterlife considerations. Next slide. So all the technology that we develop um, and here um, are presented three of our leading uh, European projects. Um, on the top is also stated, um, as I think Natalia said in the former session, we also have won the European Innovation Council um, uh, granting scheme in 2020 in the Green Deal event, uh, Green Deal edition. Um, so we, let's say, feel that responsibility on a daily basis that um, the world is uh, looking to us and to each other and we have to play our role as materials innovators. And here are three projects, Glaucos, towards uh, new degradable textiles and fishing nets, 
Vipris car to new um, materials like non-isocyanate polyurethanes for new ways to um, sleep in cities on mattresses, new ways to go to mattresses, for instance, and then vegan leather, which I have documented uh, before. Next slide. So yeah, luckily, um, you uh, can imagine that we are very, very um, linked to our lab and pilot activities, and we are very happy that three weeks after the COVID pandemic breakout, we could enter into our own polymer architecture lab um, in summer 2020, and then one year after in our biotech lab, we have opened our own uh, pilot plants, and we are at this moment with um, the B4P Now project from the European Innovation Council, we are um, starting up ton scale production of uh, strong um, and rubbery degradable plastics at the moment. Um, so, of course, um, we were very motivated to be here also today to document what happens um, in the materials field. Next slide. So yeah, this is just the documentation that we have been growing quite fast uh, through, throughout this pandemic situation. We have been awarded with the Food Planet Prize uh, 2021. That's the biggest environmental prize together with an American um, uh, scale up uh, with a value of 2 million uh, US dollar. And um, that's one of the reasons together with the help of the European Innovation uh, Bank also, um, uh, European Investment Bank, sorry, EIB, uh, linked to the EIC uh, to secure our um, uh, um, financial situation with a multi-million um, euro R&D budgets and the breakout into supply and uh, licensing agreements with a lot of partners. Here says over 75 uh, active R&D partners and a lot of partners that are testing out our novel materials. Next slide. So here is a glimpse of uh, our partners, but this is not exhaustive, but uh, I recognize very, very well what uh, was said, that partnerships are much more important than um, many other parameters <laughs> that were maybe more important 10 and 20 years ago. It is only together that we will able to find the solutions because the challenges are growing every day. And um, if we want to hand over this planet to the next generation, um, let's say it's good that we have started already uh, together to find those solutions. Next slide. So uh, this is our team a little bit in a different way, a little bit more hierarchical. Um, we are with some 20 people. Um, the reason I'm not with you is that my uh, days are full, full, full loaded. So every minute of the day is um, spent to the European bioeconomy in my life nowadays. Uh, but I like it a lot. So uh, next slide. <laughs> so that is our first location. Yeah, it's a very, it's a bit a conservative um, um, presentation in that sense. We are not so far away from Hasselt, Maastricht, Aachen. Um, so also not so far from Brussels. So sorry again that I'm not there. And uh, on our website, next slide, there is much more information. If you make yourself thoughts about a novel material that you would like to see designed for a certain urban situation or a, a new pilot we can uh, run together, please stay in contact. Um, nowadays we have a uh, contact desk and it's amazing how many uh, contacts we are accumulating and how we are also necessitated to uh, cluster and uh, uh, prioritize all, all dynamics around us. Next slide. So yeah, that's the company video. You can also, if you have 100 seconds extra today or tomorrow, you can click uh, on our website on the company video. You will see there what happens with one of the first polymer architecture companies uh, in the world. Th that's us then. And then I think the next slide is the last slide. Yes, that is where, starting with the last point, um, we are very close to um, at least five of the eight Green, green Deal uh, core targets, which are um, uh, repeated over there. Um, if you want to try something out and we accept the challenge, um, we have a track record of like an 80% uh, success rate. Um, I would not have dared to speak that out uh, four or five years ago, but history have, has shown that the proper um, 
um, accumulation, let's say, of polymer architects and the real dedication to make something happen there is um, a magic uh, recipe to uh, find solutions that we did not have available uh, yesterday and the year before. Um, so the next slide is our tech, reduce, refuse, rethink. It is an invitation, I think on the next slide. Um, yeah, it is an invitation to uh, all the people that are using materials, reduce and refuse. It's not the more, the, the better, not at all. Reduce where you can, refuse where you can. Uh, and then the rethink factor, I think that's clear from my 20 minutes or so presentation. And now I speed up to hand over back, uh, Marco, to you, and maybe to anticipate on some questions. Th thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Really impressive, a lot of uh, information, very, very uh, visionary. I, I'm keen uh, to, to visit your uh, lab and uh, to, to uh, propose some also innovation in the, in the energy sector, energy thermal energy storage or other applications that can be go beyond this one. But there are already a lot in textiles, in uh, structural engineering, uh, automotive and transport. So I'm happy that uh, a new collaboration could be established just today with <laughs> our uh, brilliant Natalie. And now I, I would like to, because the time is over, to leave the floor to our last speaker because uh, I'm afraid we don't have time for other questions because we, we have just another 15 minutes. And um, and and Rudy, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks uh, also to you for being with us, um, um, Amsterdam uh, municipality. Please, Rudy. Yeah, thank you for staying all the day to hear this last uh, presentation, in which I will um, uh, give you some insights on the activities of Amsterdam when it comes to uh, smart cities and sustainable cities. Um, the question to me was, what is Amsterdam doing in terms of policy, achievements, etc.? So I connected this mainly to the climate change uh, side of smart cities, not so much to sensors and, and other digital technologies. Um, so the picture on this, on this slide is, um, is taken from our um, Amsterdam uh, Energy Transition Roadmap 2050, which was released um, early in 2020. Um, it's not to, uh, to tell about all the details, but um, you can see that uh, compared to 1990, uh, the last measurement point, which was in 2018, we were still increasing on, on carbon, um, but we want our, tar our target uh, to be um, a minus 55% as compared to 2019. In 2030, um, but currently, um, we are not right on track for that. I will come back to that later, but uh, there is now uh, a current uh, bandwidth of being between minus 20 or minus 55. Um, but in this energy transition roadmap, it is a quite um, a general um, um, vision. Uh, there is a lot of detail, uh, detailed uh, mapping uh, uh, accomplished. Transition vision for heat, um, a neighborhood approach, for example, for uh, getting to a natural gas free city. Um, becoming more important now than it was ever, I think. Um, and uh, a vision on how to achieve low emission transport zones. But because you should understand that this uh, vision relies heavily on two major um, uh, achievements that we want to have, that is the decarbonization of the district heating system uh, which should take place uh, in part, in a large part, by uh, carbon capture and storage, which is still uh, being discussed, so it's not secured yet. And the other part is uh, decarbonization of transport. And, and for that, uh, Amsterdam is working on emission-free zones to gradually uh, remove 
um, transport that has emissions out of the city. Uh, but not only for energy, also a circular strategy uh, has been accomplished. We have guidelines on green and healthy city and also the donut economy uh, in which we, Amsterdam is working with Kate Rayworth. Um, connecting the economy and technological side with social aspects um, have been uh, accomplished. Um, so, what does it all mean? Um, what we certainly need to do in the city is to keep track of what we are doing. So, um, there is a yearly monitoring um, plan that is being released. Uh, the, the one of 2022 was released a couple of weeks ago. And what is important is that uh, what we already see as a very urgent problem at the moment is that Amsterdam, um, the district system operator for electricity, cannot cope with the rapid electrification of the, of the city. There is, uh, uh, when you want to get rid of natural gas and not going back to even more polluting uh, f fuels, then you go uh, either to hydrogen, but that might be in the further future, or electricity from renewable sources, uh, both for electric cars that is being promoted and is growing, and for heating uh, in, in the systems like with heat pumps and so on. Um, one of the major problems is that the district system operators in the Netherlands are public bodies, and they are, until now, they are, were not allowed to speculate or anticipate too much on the um, anticipated growth of electricity. So they, they should deliver on demand. But that doesn't match with the uh, planning procedures that we have in place in the Netherlands, which means that from the first ideas for new substations to realizations is about seven years. And um, a few of the city, bigger cities in, in, uh, in the Netherlands are now um, I say, lobbying with the national government to give more flexibility by legal changes to the uh, district system operators to be op able to operate more swiftly. Um, when it comes to innovation, um, already for many years, um, Amsterdam has set up um, the smart city, uh, the Amsterdam smart city platform. It is an innovation platform for small and medium uh, enterprises. For example, uh, startup companies in the field of um, uh, electrical chargers for electric vehicles um, were developed in the past, even in the time that there were hardly any electric vehicles around. Um, there is a, a platform for, for citizens to, to show them and guide them in what they can do in their own home. It's called uh, New Amsterdam's Klimaat. And on the finance side, Amsterdam provides uh, climate loans and funds um, for people that want uh, to uh, take sustainability measures but do not have the uh, financial capacity for pre-financing of those. And may, may be interesting for you if you look at uh, uh, maps.amsterdam.nl, you see um, uh, well an example of what Amsterdam does in terms of digitization and providing data to uh, inhabitants because there are maps there for, for all kinds of things like penetration of solar panels in the city, uh, where is the, what is the density of electric cars, where is the district heating system, uh, all kinds of things can be found uh, there. Um, in terms of needs, um, as I already told you, increased possibilities for the grid operators to anticipate on uh, future developments. And um, in terms of, the, um, of heat delivery, it was already in a previous presentation that most of the energy need in cities is not for, for, for power, for um, equipment and so on, but it is for, for heating and cooling. Um, Amsterdam has a lot of uh, data centers uh, in, in, uh, in the city and they um, provide waste heat. Up to now, the, um, the problem with harvesting that heat and putting it to use has been in 
well, the fact that these are commercial companies that cannot promise that they are still there in 10 years time or 15 years time. And if you want to use waste heat, you need you go to a district heating system with pipes, etc. So it requires a lot of investment. A breakthrough seems to be there now that the first data centers that uh, um, have agreed to a 15 year contract uh, are in place. And um, there is a new scheme for using their heat in a very low temperature system so that investments can be lower because insulation is not that so not anymore so important and it can be used for new uh, neighborhoods where there is a high level of insulation. Um, as an example of pilot projects that um, Amsterdam is conducting in the, in, the, in the field of smart cities, I want to uh, give some thoughts to uh, Atelier, a project that I'm working in uh, myself. It is in the northern part of Amsterdam, which is an area which uh, was rather industrialized um, uh, and is now uh, undergoing a transformation to a mixed um, living and working environment. And in this uh, area, uh, a positive energy district is um, uh, developed, uh, including an, an, a number of elements, a smart microgrid, which means that a block, the block that you see on the, on the picture, which is about 20,000 square meter of uh, usable area, in, including a hotel, living, uh, leisure, and so on. It will have one connection um, to the outside world, but also a battery and a lot of uh, renewable energy. Um, and that, well, trying to um, involve the inhabitants, the, the, the uh, the, the citizens, but also the businesses that are in there, uh, to make them aware of their energy consumption and, uh, uh, well, get to know the new technology that is uh, available. So this is the microgrid with the batteries, very good insulation. When it comes to, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, materials, um, Amsterdam is not yet so much thinking about uh, the, the plastics part that we just heard about, but um, uh, we are putting in place regulations on the use of recycled materials, which means that developers uh, increasingly need to, to use more of these uh, reused material in their, in their uh, construction. So uh, at the moment it's only 5% or 2-10%. But this will increase um, in, uh, in the future. Um, and what we are doing in terms of um, innovative governance or innovative, um, in, the, in the, let's say, the organization um, uh, of innovation, are uh, that we conduct multi stakeholder innovation ateliers with groups of stakeholders that collectively, collectively uh, tackle a problem. And problems that we are currently working on is energy communities, um, data collection and privacy, and the electricity grid connection that uh, uh, Amsterdam currently faces. I think that's about it. Uh, if you want to contact me, you, uh, here you see my email address. Thank you very much, Rudy. I was just, uh, Rudy, discussing with Marco concerning, I mean, the, the data center. I mean, the, you could also think with innovative technology somehow to store the heat and then to transport it in other places. So, I mean, there is not only the option, I would say, that you can, I mean, you have to completely develop a district heating, but there are also now storage technologies of thermal storage that can make also something like a short term and transport of this, uh, I mean, materials where you store, it can be gravels, it can be different type of materials. Did you ever consider them? Well, in, in, the, um, uh, in the projects that um, uh, are part of this positive energy district, um, aquifer thermal energy storage, which is quite common in the, in, in the Netherlands because have, we have water conducting layers in the underground. So by using heat that is harvested in the summer, uh, storing that in the, in the underground and using that for heat pumps uh, in the winter, is already uh, being practiced a lot and also in these uh, projects. Um, 
But there are also other uh, solutions. I, I, I saw this morning on my phone then that there was an article on um, storage of heat in salt. Uh, salt uh, as a phase change material, sometimes you can store a lot of heat without going to high temperatures, but by phase change. Um, the, what I know from, from this technology is it's, it's to get the heat out again, because you need to have some flow medium um, to get your, your heat back to where you want to use it is, is more or less of a, a problem as you are working with aggressive materials like salts, etc. But there are, uh, progress is being made in that, uh, in that respect. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. You go, Matteo? Maybe ju just one question on, uh, on the comment about phasing out of natural gas. Uh, what, what's your view of the use of, of biogas as a substitute? Um, well, biogas is already used, uh, but on a, on a smaller scale. Uh, let's say from uh, 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 coming from, uh, let's say, a farmer or agricultural uh, origin. Um, it often comes from manure. Um, it is a difficult uh, issue currently in the Netherlands because actually we want to go to a more vegetarian diet as a population in the in the Netherlands. Not everybody agrees to that, but the livestock um, uh, in in the Netherlands poses a lot of problems, um, not only with uh, let's say methane emissions, but also NOx. NOx emissions in the Netherlands are uh, if you look on the maps of Europe, it is really a bad situation and nature is really affected by it. So there is a huge debate in the Netherlands on reducing the livestock. So I think if biogas can give a contribution from that origin, at least, it will be uh, a modest one. Okay, I don't know if there are questions from the audience. Yes, Juan? Thanks very much. It's really great to see what the city is trying to do. Uh, my question is related to the CHP, the district heating system that you have. And you mentioned you're going you're to use carbon capture. And it's very difficult to see that happening in the city. And I just wondered whether you, um, you already cracked it or not. And why are you not thinking really seriously about other water heat pumps? or hydrogen, because you're close to the water? Yeah, well, the, um, the district heating system in Amsterdam, um, let's say, originates from about 20 years ago. Um, they have a, 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 a tough challenge greening their, uh, their district heating. Uh, so, uh, in part, it is now from the municipal waste facility, so it's not all fossil fuels that are being burned. Uh, and in the newer um, development areas of Amsterdam, uh, nowadays uh, the developers have the option to go to heat pumps and not being obliged to um, connect to the district heating system. So uh, actually this, this effort of uh, getting uh, rid of natural gas, um, in that effort the uh, Transition fission heat was established in which the city is divided in many, many uh, small neighborhoods. For, and for all of those, uh, they have f tried to figure out what is the best solution there. Because you also need the uh, acceptance of citizens, especially if they already live there in their house and, and systems need to be changed. So the... the the strategy of Amsterdam is, is, is both on the district heating and greening the, the, um, uh, the fuels of that, in part maybe by uh, geothermal energy, also going to heat pumps, better insulation, and the like. There is one question, please. Amsterdam is doing a remarkable work also in the social, ha social housing. But what about the smart uh, uh, things you are doing with the earth? Because you have problems, static problems, as we say with the engineers. 
because of the water and nearby to the sea. Uh, the earth over there, you have a problem, so, and you are managing the water in a way. But are there any other smart innovations about the issue? On, on the water management? Um, I, I'm not sure whether I have understood your question right. Do you know? Uh, Concerning the subsidence, you mean? The subsidence of the earth, you mean? Amsterdam, Amsterdam yeah. actually is on the, on the sea. Yeah. So when you are on the sea and you are taking the sea out, uh, the, the ground is not so stable. And your city faces such problems. You have also a director on this issue, an engineer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, the saying goes, Amsterdam is built on poles. Uh, that's actually true. But uh, in, in indeed, um, the, the underground um, uh, is a concern in Amsterdam. Uh, we have seen that with the uh, uh, establishment of one of the, uh, our subway lines, when um, uh, problems occurred, and also with the uh, degradation of uh, the, the signs of the canals. So a lot of uh, repair work is needed there in the, in the future. Um, whether there are any specific innovations in that area, I don't know. But uh, work in progress, I would say. OK, thank you, Rudy. I don't know if there are other questions. I don't know, Matteo, if you have questions. No, that's it. So I think we are right on time, because we should have uh, finished uh, three minutes ago. I give one. Uh, one sentence, then I give the floor to Marco for uh, the conclusions. I mean, thank you to all the speakers, to Natalia, Stefan, Rudy, and Matteo. I think that this uh, second session has showed us uh, I mean, potential applications in different uh, fields, from uh, mobility to, to new materials uh, for different applications, and the example of one city. Amsterdam, that is for sure working, uh, I mean, on the side of both, uh, I mean, greening the decarbonization side and trying, I think, also from what I understood to look for the future of mobility also with new projects uh, in uh, different neighborhoods that will have to, to technology use to use the best technologies. On the other side, thanks to Matteo, we have seen that there is a possibility for cities, we have seen that both Dortmund and Amsterdam, they have got their city loans or, I mean, or city funds to help, uh, I think, the citizens, from what I understood, that wants to install different technologies. But the other way around, Matteo has showed that there is a possibility from city managers to, to propose new projects, uh, big projects for the cities, uh, and uh, to ask, uh, I mean, private money. For sure, as Matteo showed us, uh, Mark and me, we work at European Commission and European Innovation Council is trying to promote the synergies of public and private funds. For sure, not in this case mainly for the cities, but we, we try to promote synergies of companies from uh, public and private funds. But I think that this session has showed us that there is the opportunity for the, for the cities to implement the technologies. And for sure, there is always the policy side. We were speaking before with Dortmund cities that uh, some city rulements and are not, I mean, startup friendly, because when, uh, when public procurement has to buy something, they want to see the story behind the, to I mean to give them the assurance that the technology is working since many years and this is something maybe that in the future the city will have to discuss how to to be not the risk not so risk adverse but prone to I mean to the innovation and to helping the startups in installing uh, I mean <coughs> new technologies I would like uh, to thank again all the participants and I leave to Marco for the conclusions well, you say you, you said everything, so I, I just uh, have to thank you again, everybody. I have just something in mind. I remember the Helsinki Challenge. I don't know if someone knows about this. Very, very interesting initiative for the city of Helsinki uh, with an award of 1 million euro a couple of years ago. We tried to participate uh, uh, when I was at Imperial Researcher, trying to mobilize a brilliant breakthrough ideas research to decarbonize the city of Helsinki. Uh, 
including a lot of uh, innovation on heat pumps, district heating, um, to face their specific problems. They attract uh, um, a lot of uh, yes um, breakthrough ideas, uh, and with this smart competition, to give money in the form of award to the best uh, innovative idea to be then implemented, of course. Uh, I think that is a good way also to, um, uh, to mobilize the, the uh, new uh, smart ideas from uh, um, academia, innovators, startups, uh, and uh, try to facilitate this co contamination. But this requires that, of course, municipalities will be able to uh, proactively um, put in practice these uh, ambitious uh, uh, programs, as I see you um, Ralph, are uh, doing, and also uh, the, the city of Dortmund before. So uh, I think that uh, there is a lot uh, to do, but we are on the right uh, uh, way, and I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to have have, um, yes, listening to this uh, very nice presentation. Sorry, we, we had no time for uh, more questions, uh, but uh, I, I'm sure we will find the opportunity soon. Thank you again. Bye bye. Thank you. Uh, so this is the close of the day. Uh, this morning we set out with two objectives, so just to remind the audience. So we were going to discuss the just and clean urban transition, as well as the future of the uh, smart cities marketplace. And I think we covered a lot of ground to, 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 to those questions. Although we still have to cover some more ground tomorrow as, as well. Uh, tomorrow we'll start at 10, we'll rec reconvene at 10 with the financial panel. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that you know st struck me as, as, as quite interesting. We, you know, this morning we had the opening speech by Commissioner Simpson, uh, stressing the uh, the climate uh, neutral cities uh, mission uh, with 100, 100 cities becoming climate neutral by 2030, oversubscribed with 377 cities, and hopefully they will be embraced all of them rather than 100. Just have them all on board, 377. Just recognize the, recognize the ambition and the, uh, and the effort that's being put into those, uh, you know, in, into those cities. Then we had the political panel, and what struck me there is, I think it was Paula Pinto who was saying, cities are the living labs. That's where it happens. That is the flywheel for change. This, these, are the, these are the areas where energy transition and urban, uh, clean urban transition is, is really happening. She was stressing the urgency. However, there was this sort of counter comment by Tartu. Uh, they were saying, well, that's true, but cities cannot really decide for the companies and households in the cities. They can facilitate, but they're not the decision makers. So we really have to sort of embrace the whole ecosystem, get the companies on board as well as the citizens on board. It's all about a just transition, and uh, we need to really, really be mindful of the energy poverty issues that are really, really pressing and, and urgent today. Tartu was also saying the crisis is helping us. I like that sort of phrasing as, as well. Never waste a good crisis. It's also, it's also an opportunity for change and profound change uh, to be happening in the, in, the, in the coming years. There were some items around how, how do we make this bigger, this, this, this transition? And there was the comment by Schaarbeek here in, here in Brussels. Uh, they, she was reminding herself to the Kyoto time, so the Kyoto uh, tables, conversation tables. So it's really about how do we replicate best practice through conversation and engagement with, with citizens. And that was also reinforced by Tartu as well. Uh, they have something that's called the climate assemblies. I would like to learn more about that. How does, how does it actually work with climate assemblies? And also they were mentioning hackathons as, as well. Then we moved over to the innovation panel. What struck me there, was, it was quite a crowded presentation with lots of information. But what, what I learned from that, that there's actually a lot of funding available and also there's prizes available. And through you know, connectedness, competence and capital, you can really create an in innovation ecosystem that ca can work. And a sort of comforting message as well, and I was looking at our investor here, is, uh, what was said was the distance between cities and investors is not so big as it may seem. Uh, some people were saying you could just pick up the phone and, and phone, but you need to make it easy for, uh, for investors to, to get access to the innovations by showcasing your project ideas in a sort of central place as well. You know, 
uh, examples from Boston and Austin were mentioned as sort of good examples of how you, how you, could, how you could do that. There was also a message for, for smaller cities in particular, just don't be afraid, be ambitious, be bold, think big. That was a message that I, I liked as well. And from, from um, Patricia, uh, the three things that were on, on, on their slide, catalytic leadership, standardization, and blending public and private, not only finance, but also competences. I like that, that uh, as well. And then the two fantastic presentations from our innovators, so the uh, electrical trailers, as, as well as the, sort of the, uh, the sustainable plastics, and a very down-to-earth presentation by my former colleague, Rudy Roth, about what's happening in Amsterdam, what's happening on the ground, and the importance of monitoring and showing that you have an, have an impact uh, there. So with that, I'd, I'd like to close for the day. I think the most important thing for this day is to see you, to be talking to you, to be almost shaking hands with some of you. That's what I really liked about uh, today. And hopefully we can continue that conversation tomorrow as well. Thank you very much. Hope to see you tomorrow.